Hello and welcome back to my studio. Today we're going to look at atmosphere and depth in your paintings. Six typical mistakes and how to avoid them. Master these and you'll have paintings with a lot more atmosphere and depth and who doesn't want that? So let's have a closer look. Okay, when you've got a landscape and you're trying to paint that very often, you are thinking about just trying to get the representation correct, get the shapes in the right place, the colors and that sort of thing. But so often we forget about the atmospherics and that sense of three dimensionality. So we look at the end result and think, well, I don't know what happened there, but it just doesn't have that atmospheric look to it. But something's missing exactly what is that. It's hard to pinpoint those things. So you may recognize these common mistakes and think, well, okay, that's what I did. Next time you won't do that and your painting will look so much better. So I'm going to show these tips quite quickly and then by the end of it, you'll have a good idea of what to avoid next time you're painting your landscape painting. Let's have a look. So mistake number one is a lack of value contrast. So that means getting a contrast between the strong values. Remember values means light and dark or the degree of lightness or darkness of a shape. So what we want is darkest shapes near the foreground and as shapes go into the distance they must get lighter. The big mistake is keeping all your values similar. Frequently it's too dark and the distant objects are just as dark as those in the middle. So that's something we have to sort out and make sure our value contrast goes from dark and gradually lighter as you go into the distance. So as we look at this picture, I could have a fence post here and it could be pretty dark. It's right in the foreground and I could take the post a little bit further, but as I take them further into the distance, they must get lighter as well. You could pick up a little bit of directional light on your post in the foreground as well. But as it goes into the distance, it's pretty much just going to start fading away and getting lighter and cooler. So I'm adding white, a bit of blue. It's also going to get smaller as well and fade away into the distance. The other darks that we see in the, the picture are the trees. Now trees will be fairly dark because they are vertical and not getting as much sunlight. So these trees right back here, still quite dark, but compared to the overhanging trees, which we got at the top over here, they have to be quite a bit darker. So these over here overhanging right in the foreground are going to be quite dark. So these have got to really start cooling down with more blue and getting softer as well. The tops of the trees will get some reflected light from the sky and could be a little softer as well. Over here, trees, as you can see, are much, much lighter. Now we can look at them and say, that, oh, they are pretty dark. But look closer, compare them to these in the foreground or in the middle ground here, this foreground there. And there's some also in the middle ground here. So these way back here have got to be much lighter. They're just fading back. Okay, the next problem is using too much saturated color in the distance. Now look at these distant hills, there's some grass over there. Now if I took this deep yellow and put that over there, that is a very 
bright and saturated yellow and there'd be no real difference to the yellow I put in the foreground. They are basically the same saturation of color, much too bright back there. It could be okay over here, it could work out and we could have some saturated greens as well and a bit of variety, but all pretty strong colors. Back there we got to get rid of that yellow. As colors recede and in particular yellow they'll get cooler, desaturated and yellow will give way to something more like a yellow ochre. It's better but it's still quite saturated. Just look at how diffused that color is in the, the reference. All that atmosphere in between us and that distant shape. So atmosphere will need some white. Let's bring in some cerulean to soften that down even more and cool it. Mix it in. Okay, that is a lot better. That may be just enough and you work back and forth until you get the right saturation you want. Let's just get rid of that again and now you can see what we had was too bright. Put that in and that's more like it. Alright, the next biggest problem, ignoring atmospheric effects. So we want to avoid overlooking the importance of atmospheric effects such as haze and mist, even atmospheric perspective as it's sometimes called, that's taking into account how colors change over the distance. So we've already suggested some of that already, but we can see some mist at the foot of some of those hills. So let's get a bit of white, blue and alizarin and uh, we can start putting some of that in at the foot of the distant mountain and creating that misty effect. Even some right back Just glimpse behind there. Let's just take that up a little bit. And even the trees, we can mix in some blue, a bit of yellow ochre, and we can get some misty looking trees. Right, and one of the important things, of course, is having a look at how that mist is influencing, or the haze, or whatever it may be, is influencing the edges of shapes, much softer edges. All right, so that's how atmosphere and the haze and all the mist or whatever it may be, those atmospheric conditions is going to influence. All right, the next mistake is making distant objects too detailed. Okay, so that is so often the case. Let's say we've got some trees way back here and now we go and put in tree trunks and uh, they come forward you can't see that detail in real life. Those details don't exist. Don't put them in. Okay, we, we don't need to see that. Too many suggestion of high definition details. It's not relevant. It's not practical. It doesn't really exist. But we put them in and it can look wrong. Let's say very hard edged animals. Right? We've got cows in that distant field but they are so defined it's like we're standing right by them in, but in fact they should be way into that distance and barely noticeable or much smaller and the colors have to change as well. So watch out for, for that. Also another frequent problem is We'll see a beginner put in a house, let's say. 
a house like that and then we get these high definition door and windows you know as black dots when that is clearly never going to be the case or we get a bright red roof now that's coming forward and those details are much too hard okay so you want to soften that all up if there is a house back there it's not going to be a stark white it's going to be a cool white uh, if it's got a red roof it's going to be diffused so make sure we do that it almost becomes a dusky pink and you don't put any doors or windows in there because it'll stand out like a sore thumb. Right, next problem is we disregard scale and proportion. Incorrect sizing or proportioning of objects within the landscape will disrupt that sense of depth. Okay, so shapes and sizes have to correspond together. Alright, so you could have a tall utility pole over here that's fine and then that will get shorter and shorter and shorter if you had a tall utility pole starting back here it would look completely wrong impossible for that to be practical also that house of course if we had a house that's as big as those trees it's going to be wrong as well so we've got to get things correctly in proportion to emphasize the distance and uh, make sure we don't have anything looking obviously incorrect but sometimes hard to avoid if you're not really paying attention, that can happen. The other common one would be something like fence posts as well. You'll find a fence post further away, but it's too thick. So you'd cut in with some of your surrounding colors just to bring it back into scale. It needs to be shorter as well and thinner. And then it will be corresponding and logical. This one could be taller as well. Next common mistake is neglecting aerial perspective. Now, aerial perspective is where distant objects become less distinct and lighter in value and bluer in color. Now we've spoken a bit about that already, but one aspect I want to emphasize is that of color temperature. All right, so you've got your warm colors in the foreground, yellow becomes cooler, turns into an ochre color and that then turns into a pinkish color and the pink disappears, things get bluer. Right until ultimately you get that sort of hazy blue that disappears far away. So it's not just value. It's not just edges, it's not just saturation, but also color temperature. Your colors get cooler. And by that, I mean normally adding something like blue and white to reduce the temperature of a color. Now we see we've got some beautiful warm colors in the foreground. And I can use yellows and reds, etc. to bring that out but adding blue and white dramatically drops that color temperature. Be careful of using too much white it can make things just too pale and cold. The frequent problem with paintings is that too much white paint has been used. Rather use white to adjust the value add a bit of color back in to get some of that temperature back so you don't have white chalky color. 
Okay, I think those are the, the six main points to getting an atmospheric painting that reads correctly. So avoid the mistakes that we've mentioned and your painting will get that atmospheric feel and sense of depth. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. If you've had a look at your paintings and you see a few of these mistakes cropping up, well, now you'll keep an eye out for them and you won't make them again. And of course, your paintings are going to look great as a result. Well, I hope you practice that and really get into creating that atmospheric look to your paintings with values and colors and edges. It'll make a huge difference. Now, if you're interested to see how this painting turned out, I did actually go ahead with uh, recording the completion of the painting. But be sure to subscribe and hit notifications because that video will be coming up very soon and you'll be able to watch how this painting turns out. So don't miss that. Don't also miss the free course for you up here. If you're interested in seeing my painting school, you'll get a free introduction there, some useful information for you. So be sure to check that out as well. All right, that's it for now. Until next time, enjoy your painting and cheers for now. Thank you.